before, I think I'll start off by uh, saying one of my conclusions up front, um, which is that I don't believe we get to socialism by uh, multiplying cooperatives, um, like mushrooms after the rain. Um, I think uh, cooperatives are just one tactic, one weapon among many in our arsenal. Uh, uh, cooperatives, trade unions, electoral organizations, any number of uh, ways that the working class can organize itself to secure strong points in the course of the struggle. And that cooperatives are one weapon among many. And I think that it's in that sense of strategy and tactics that they're, they're best looked at rather than uh, any uh, overall utopian kind of solution. I'll start by saying that just over two years ago, uh, very few people in the United States had ever heard of Mondragon. Uh, the only ones I knew who knew anything about it were a small minority of people on the Catholic left and a few of us who had been active in the plant closing movements uh, in the 1990s. But it was this, only this little niche market that knew anything about uh, the Mondragon cooperatives. Uh, and then one day, uh, two years ago, all of a sudden, it was on the front page of every newspaper at the top of every uh, newscast uh, on the evening news in the entire country. And the reason why was that the largest industrial union in the United States at that time, the United Steelworkers, with 1.2 million member members, announced a formal agreement with the Mondragon uh, Cooperative Corporation, the world's largest network of worker cooperatives, uh, to try to develop uh, worker-owned cooperatives uh, in the United States. Um, so this was big news. A year later, uh, when I was uh, at Mondragon, one of the top guys at Mondragon said, what's happening? I come here to this meeting and the same question comes up. What's going on? We haven't heard anything. <laughs> what's been going on? Actually, uh, some things have been going on. Um, and uh, that's what I'm going to try to explain. Uh, the kinds of things that have been going on are is that the Steelworkers Union have been going through a series of things that they don't think work. Uh, they're extremely cautious uh, about it. They're also insistent upon that the project is still alive and that they are still committed to it. I was told that by an international vice president uh, just uh, two weeks ago. I think the... Um, thing to do is to understand from the steelworkers point of view how they got interested in this because like everybody else they had never heard of Mondragon either they learned about it in a very indirect way Leo Girard the new uh, president of the uh, um, United Steelworkers has realized he's got to make some changes in order for his union to survive and thrive First of all, it's hardly steelworkers alone anymore. One thing he did was to merge with the United Rubber Workers. Another was to merge with a group of young technical computer guys and formed a whole new youth contingent that are also members of the United Steelworkers. The reason is that the steelworkers was among the hardest hit by the deindustrialization that started in the 1980s. It's most evident in the area of the country that I come from, Pennsylvania where in the Pittsburgh area went from having nearly half of the working class involved with the steel or metal production in one way or to another, it's now down to 10%. And Pittsburgh, if you want to think realistically about the working class of Pittsburgh today, the vast majority of the working class of Pittsburgh are healthcare workers and teachers. And steel workers uh, only represent a minority, small, uh, less than 10%. So how does the Steelworkers Union deal with this? You have a huge numbers of unemployed workers, a huge problem of structural unemployment, and they realize that the only way ahead, or at least Leo Girard realizes that the only way ahead is through what he calls a green and clean energy manufacturing revolution, and that he needs friends and allies to do this. Leo Girard loves windmills. He will go on at great length and tell you exactly how many pounds of steel and how many moving parts are in each wind turbine and that they know how to make steel and parts. And uh, 
So he's very interested in seeing a massive expenditure of funds on the scale of preparing for World War II, but instead of going to war, uh, creating the basis of green and clean energy. And he sees that in that strategic context, uh, the future of the United Steelworkers. To get to move on it, he got nowhere with the federal government. A lot of talk, a lot of promises, but absolutely nothing has happened of any significance. One thing that did happen of significance was an arrangement he made with the governor of Pennsylvania. He and Ed Rendell put their heads together and they found three vacant closed down steel uh, mills. Uh, but they didn't have any luck with American capitalists. These guys were too busy gambling on Wall Street. So they went to Spain and they found a Spanish firm named Gameza, which built state-of-the-art windmills. And as I said, Leo Girard loved windmills. <laughs> so they made a deal, the state of Pennsylvania, the United Steelworkers Union and Gameza. They took two of these shutdown plants and converted them to make the turbines. And the third plant was converted to make the blades. And the deal was uh, Gameza got some tax breaks but they agreed that they would not challenge in any way any attempt at a union election. So 1,000 new jobs were created, all United Steelworkers, uh, and Gameza is busily building state-of-the-art wind turbines in Pennsylvania in cooperation with the state and with the United Steelworkers, and there's 1,000 new hired uh, steelworkers, people doing this that are making decent money. So these are new jobs. So this is a big deal and it was very positive. Um, and so Leo Girard's first reaction uh, to the Gameza rep was great, what else can we do? And the Gameza rep was a guy named Michael Peck. And he said, have you ever heard of Mondragon? And Leo said, no. So he took off his Gameza hat and he also happened to be the US representative for Mondragon. Uh, so he put on his Mondragon hat and said, let's go and we'll take you to Mondragon. So a, a representative delegation of the steelworkers went to Mondragon, fell in love with the ideas, and uh, were very dutifully impressed. And so they signed the agreement. And it was on the front page of all the newspapers uh, within a matter of a week. Um, so the question is, what happened next? So there we run into a story. Some of it, uh, previous speakers covered. The U.S. has a long history ups with an upside and a downside on cooperatives, going back to the 19th century, when you here in Europe sent us all of your utopian socialists, and they set up their experiments in different parts of the country, including the uh, Ohio River Valley where I live. I have little towns named economy, freedom, harmony, unity. They're all named after virtues because the followers of Fourier and Owen and these guys built their communes there. The only thing that's left is the name of the town and a little museum in the center of each one that tells you the story, but the, the uh, impact of the uh, utopian communes is gone. The other ones we know of that were mentioned were from the populist era. You go out in the Midwest of the United States today and in the center of every little town you'll see a co-op sign for the gas station and a huge co-op sign on the uh, grain elevators and these things, or the grocery store, and these things uh, function as co-ops and function quite well, and they're quite popular. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, almost all, up to the 1950s, almost all plywood that was made in the United States was made by a series of worker co oh, completely worker-owned plywood cooperatives in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, in Pittsburgh, there was a whole town uh, that was uh, worker-owned, and the steel mill within it was worker-owned, and it lasted for nearly 30 years until it finally went under in the 1950s. So we have had some experience with these things. But the most recent experience in the memory of workers today are with the clamp closing movements of the, in the 1980s, and which in the course of a number of the different battles that we went through to try to keep these plants open, uh, one tactic that was deployed was called ESOPs. 
ESOP being the acronym for Employee Stock Ownership Plan. And uh, for most of the steelworkers' cases, and the most of the cases where the steelworkers use ESOPs, this turned out to be a disaster. One of the disasters was a, a big one, was cl uh, close to where I have about 20 miles from my home, uh, Weirton Steel. Weirton Steel was a major manufacturer of steel, quite a large mill. Uh, and the workers took it over because it was about to shut down, and they turned it into an ESOP where they all owned to pull their money, and they ended up owning the shares of stock in it. And for several years, it ran quite well. The workers made a few bucks, and they managed to keep their jobs. In the course of competition, however, they found out they needed capital. They needed to make some loans. They couldn't get any from the banks, so they got loans the way other companies get loans. They sold shares of stock. A deadly move. Because part of who bought the shares of stock was the International Steel Group, which had just completed a merger with Metal Steel, and then became another merger, became ArcelorMittal. It's based here in Europe, one of the largest steel combines in the world. What they managed to do by taking advantage of the workers' need, where the workers sold stock to raise capital, was to take it over. As a result, to make a long story short, 95% of the workers in Weirton Steel have been fired. Not only fired, lost what investment they had. Only a small 5% still remains open uh, in a kind of small boutique meal that Metal kept uh, functioning. So when you mention the word ESOP or employee ownership to steel workers in our part of the country, they're extremely negative about the idea. Now, this is in spite of the fact that there are a few ESOPs that uh, uh, the steel workers are involved in that work quite well. In all, there are some 11,500 ESOPs in the United States, and they have a left wing, a uh, center, and a right, and a right wing. Uh, the right wing versions of them are simply ESOPs are financial instruments that rip off the workers to the advantage of the uh, owners or former owners who use it as a, web, a way to fleece them. Uh, the ones on the left wing of the spectrum are very close to what we would call worker uh, cooperatives. Uh, the stock is still held. The stock is still held by, uh, you know, a independent agency, and the workers still get their dividends from it. Uh, but it's uh, uh, they do go to some lengths to practice workplace democracy, and so there's a quite a uh, there's a sizable number of these uh, in the United States uh, that. Uh, we would uh, not want to uh, criticize that they actually do a decent job of it and they're quite popular with the workers, but they are not the ma majority of ESOPs uh, by any stretch of the imagination. The majority fall somewhere in the middle between, between the two schemes. Anyway, before the steel workers could sell the idea of doing a Mondragon type uh, worker cooperatives, it first has to combat a huge resistance among its own members to the whole idea that their solution is going to be by some form of employee stock ownership plan. And there is uh, all the difference in the world between uh, a Mondragon style uh, worker co-op and an ESOP, but you have a negative kind of education work to overcome. So that's part of uh, what's uh, slowing them down and making progress at a snail's pace. Once the workers get the idea of Mondragon, they're extremely enthusiastic about it. But you have to overcome the legacy of what they went through and how they got screwed in the 1980s and 90s uh, when they went through all these uh, uh, various battles. The other thing to remember is the nature of the Mondragon model. The Mondragon model is often misunderstood. When people start thinking of worker co-ops, the first thing they start thinking about is, well, how do they organize it, and how do the workers vote, and who gets to, who gets to say what, and what are we going to make, and that sort of thing. That is not how Mondragon began. Mondragon began first with a school. It started the school first, a technical school. 
and spend a good number of years educating a number of young workers with technical skills. Second, it got Basque peasants to dig their meager funds out of their mattresses and pool them together in a small credit union. That small credit union, after a number of transformations, is now La Caja Laboral, one of the large, quite a large bank, 4.2 billion euros in assets. But it meant that the workers owned their own bank. So in Mondragon, the workers owned their own credit union and owned their own school before they built the first factory. Very important. Why? Because when we hear these stories of why different co-ops failed, what is one of the main reasons? Credit. They can't get credit. Mondragon solved that problem by having their own worker own bank. The second reason that uh, is not so often given is innovation and skill. Well, in Mondragon's case, it has its own Mondragon University and its network of uh, seven think tanks and R&D centers to come up with its own. They don't have to go elsewhere and, and pay kind of outrageous things. But the most important thing you have to remember for a worker co-op to be successful. Part of the steelworkers present strategy is not necessarily the best one. And I've argued with them about it as have other people. Their idea is by playing their things very cautiously, they're looking around for, you know, a small business say that maybe makes machine screws and it's making a profit has a couple hundred workers and the owner is about 80 years old ready to retire and none of his kids want anything to do with the plant so in that case they would like to find somebody else's money some other source of capital go in and buy up about six places like this and then convert them to worker co-ops that's their current plan and what they're working on and they've still searching they found a few places and then turned them down and they're still looking or different uh, places like this, and they're also still looking for the sources of capital. The Steelworkers has their own money, in a way. They also have a, you know, their own pension funds. But like I said, a lot of their workers are very nervous about how it gets used, and they're especially nervous about anything with employee ownership in it because of their previous negative experience. So again, there's an educational problem there that has to be overcome. The alternative thing to think about is what makes for a worker cooperative to succeed. There are three simple things that make it succeed. One, the workers have to want to do it. They have to want to do it. It sounds very simple, but believe me, it's not. Number two, they have to trust each other. That's another thing that sounds simple, but it's not so difficult, it's not so easy. The reason they have to trust each other is they are risking their energy, their time, their sweat equity, their funds. Third, they have to have a quality product that makes a customer happy, a good business plan that's not biting off more than they can chew. And a lot of thought has to go into that. So if you take those three qualities and combine it with a school and a worker-owned credit union, you've got a winning combination and you can start from scratch. You don't have to go around trying to buy something and then impose a model from, top, from the top down. Your uh, co-op grows more organically. So those are some of the different issues uh, that are uh, concer uh, concerned. Uh, there are probably, you know, as I said, 11,500 ESOPs in the United States. At the moment, there are less than 500 worker co-ops. Some of them are quite, doing quite well. Uh, there's uh, uh, King Arthur Flower in the Northeast, has 250 workers. Uh, Chroma Technologies has uh, over 100 workers, produces high-tech high electron microscopes, uh, worker-owned and controlled uh, 
Uh, so the guy who runs it, who came up with it, is an old SDS guy who decided he wanted to be a socialist and entrepreneur and uh, did it quite successfully. So we have these little green shoots of the future uh, popping up here and there that uh, we can learn from and take advantage of it. And a lot more of them are starting to come up because of the whole movement around a solidarity economy. And now, with the steelworkers having broken the ice, many more unions are starting to look into these things as being flexible. And they're certainly interested into it for another reason. Most of the people involved in the solidarity economy movement are under 35 years old. Most of the people in the American trade union movement are over 45 years old. So they are particularly interested in forming alliances with young people. Uh, the United Steelworkers is a case in point with its Blue-Green Alliance, which is especially interested in trying to work with young people to start up new solar installation companies and things like this as part of this uh, worker co-op uh, uh, idea that, that they can work together with young people to build the kind of alliances that they need. So these are some of the uh, lessons uh, that I would sum up. There's probably a lot more to be said, and we can get into it in some discussion. Uh, if you want the long version of it, just Google my name and uh, Mondragon, and uh, I wrote a small book on it. You can pick it up. Uh, but anyway, uh, thank you for having me here, and especially thank you to Rosen Luxemburg for showing the internationalism and paying my way, and I'm, I'm very, very glad that you did. Thank you very much.